So, the Halo Wars 2 beta for the Xbox One is over, and I thought it was around time that I shared some thoughts on it. For those that don't know, uh, and haven't been following my channel since the dawn of time, I started this YouTube channel with Halo Wars gameplay. I played a ton of Halo Wars back a few years ago, quite competitively actually, I had a lot of fun, but uh, then the game died out, I quit, uh, and really nobody thought that there would ever be a sequel. But here we are, 5, 6, 7 years later, and the Halo Wars 2 beta is out. Now, obviously, I had to give it a try and see what it's like, and I, I gotta be honest here, uh, the first impressions that I had about the game, they were not very positive at all. It's actually the reason that this video took so long, because after playing it on the first day, I didn't really feel the need to come back and play more of it, and I think that uh, that comes for a big part down to the many crashes, the horrible performance, and the clunky and delayed responsiveness of uh, the user interface. Now I know that it is a beta I know and that the game is still in a very early state. So before I talk about those issues a little bit more and lay down my concerns, I want to look past that and see what this game has to offer. I mean, that is what I did myself as well. Uh, I believe today that that match came out. I gave the beta another try. I looked past the many issues and nuances and I really got a feel for what this game is all about. Right off the bat, I noticed how similar the game was to the first Halo game in terms of controls, but also in terms of features. I mean, units and buildings are still selected using the selection wheel. You can still jump between bases and units with uh, the arrow keys, which I like very much. Buildings are still attached to the main base in predefined locations. And these are all things that uh, we are familiar with. But for every feature that the game kept, it has also added something new or changed something around. And I think that those are very interesting things to talk about. Uh, for example, instead of just having supplies as the only income needed, Halo Wars 2 has energy as well, which uh, is a secondary form of income. They are very similar to the way that StarCraft does it, uh, with minerals and gas. The Halo Wars 2 resources and the StarCraft minerals are generally used to produce a lot of early game units. Uh, they usually cost little or no energy at all. But then when you want to build up and maybe spec into some stronger units or some late game stuff, you will need more and more gas and energy. Now, as you all know, the first Halo Wars game also had a tech level instead of a secondary resource. Um, this tech level, however, is still present in the second Halo Wars game, but you don't have to build reactors uh, on your base to increase that tech level. Instead, you just upgrade your main base. And just as with the original one, some units, buildings or upgrades cannot be bought without having a certain tech level first. Uh, again, it actually works in a very similar fashion to StarCraft, uh, this time uh, with the Zerg race in particular, where you can upgrade your main base to a lair or a hive to unlock new buildings and new units. And just like in StarCraft, in Halo Wars 2, the best base counts. Another big change that was made from Halo Wars 1 to Halo Wars 2 is that you will now upgrade your units and buildings in groups. Previously, if you wanted to upgrade your tanks, for example, you had to purchase specific upgrades for your tanks. Um, canister shell, power turret, and even, you know, the grizzlies, which no one ever bought. But all these things made the tank stronger uh, and left all the other units pretty far behind considering how big of an investment each of these upgrades were uh, and with how popular downtaking was, so to speak, because you don't want to fall too far behind in production. This made it so that you couldn't really switch up unit types mid-game because, of course, any other unit that isn't a tank would not benefit from those upgrades and they wouldn't really stand a chance versus the enemy's well-upgraded units. Now Halo Wars 2 changed this around, where each building allows you to globally upgrade the units that you can build in that specific structure. In the barracks, for example, you have infantry upgrade 1, 2 and 3, which increases the damage and health of all infantry units by 15, 30 and 45% respectively. The same goes for the vehicles in the vehicle depot, the air units in the air pad, and even for your buildings and turrets in the armory. The game has also made some uh, additions and improvements on the whole combat itself that make it a more interesting experience. There is now a low and a high ground mechanic where units are not able to attack units that are above them if they do not have vision of those and this isn't just a very black and white scenario with some ground that is considered low ground and some ground that is considered high ground. The map actually fluctuates a lot in height, there are several sniper towers which can actually give you a good amount of vision and because of this, positioning is much more important. In addition to the low and the high ground, I've also noticed that some of the units have an insane attack range. For example, the newly introduced units such as uh, the Sniper, the, the Kodiak, I believe it's called, and the, the Covenant Blister back. They have the ability to hit units that are more than a full screen away from you. It, it's crazy. 
I've used these in combination with the watchtowers and uh, the high ground to blow enemies away and even bases away before their armies could get to my units. I mean, in return, my marines have also been killed as soon as they left the base because the snipers kept picking them off, but that's a story I'd rather not talk about. Another thing that they've added to the game is uh, a cloaking mechanic. Uh, certain units can cloak themselves or can cloak allied units in a specific area, and when those units are cloaked, the enemy cannot see or attack them. Even if you know that those units are there, you still cannot select them and thus your units will not be attacking those. They will just stand still and do not move. Uh, to counter cloaked units, you will need detection. Just like there are units that can cloak, there are also units and even buildings that have an automatic detection and thus they reveal any cloaked enemies in that area. I think that this mechanic also kind of has been taken from StarCraft, but uh, I think it's great and it's gonna provide some interesting gameplay opportunities. Now the last big addition that they added to the game, in my opinion, are the Commander Power Tech Trees. Um, as I said earlier, Halo Wars 1 allowed you to drop a Mag Blast, a Cryo, or a Heal, or maybe some ODSTs, depending on what leader you're playing at that moment. Now in Halo Wars 2 you still have those, but what is new is that you actually have to unlock them through this Commander Tech Tree. While playing each game, you get Commander Points. I don't know exactly how you get these points, I think it is by time, but I'm not too sure. But the thing is that you can spend these points to unlock any of these icons. Now these icons, they are upgrades to your character. They're not permanent, they reset every game, so don't think it's like uh, the more I play the better I get. But this is your tech tree and you can choose different upgrades each game. Now some of these upgrades are passive buffs, like a 5 or a 10% reduction in, uh, in the cost of your upgrades. But other abilities can be things such as the Mech Blast that we know from Halo Wars 1. These cards are also available to the Covenant and each leader will have their own tech tree with different things that they can buy. One game you might want to spec into a very powerful heal, and another game you're going to focus on dropping down units like ODSD, Cyclopses, Tank Turrets and all that stuff. You can also decide to upgrade the speed of your units uh, or increase the rate at which they gain veterancy. Um, and oh, for those that don't know, yes, units can still level up if they manage to kill enemy units or buildings. But instead of seeing stars above their health bars, you will now have a small icon that says 1, 2 or 3. But those are options that you can buy with those commander points. And there are many, many more like upgrades for the heal or even mines that you can place down. The only thing that I really dislike about this tech tree is the level 5 abilities that you can unlock when you're about 15 minutes into the game. Basically, these abilities are supposed to be the ultimate leader power, and I gotta say, they really are. Um, maybe it's just because I haven't had enough time with the game yet, but I feel that these are just so powerful, and they literally destroy the enemy's entire army with just one click of the button. It's kind of phase roll, to be honest. I've won games just using marines and using my pelican close air support to cleanse anything in my way that the marines couldn't deal with. Now, I don't know if that is just because the enemies are not good enough, or because this is kind of broken. I don't want to go too much into it about what I think of it. It's still, of course, a very early version of the game and changes will be made for sure. Besides that, I don't think that I'm in a position to talk about balance right now as the game doesn't have a meta. I'm not good enough at the game yet to really decide what's good and what's not. And I haven't even had the time to try out a lot of the other units extensively. I'm just sharing my experience with these leader powers. I mean, I can tell you what I did most of the games. I can even show it to you. I've, I've got lots of footage. Uh, usually I started off making two supply pads on my main, then uh, take the veterancy upgrades on the commander tree, send my marines uh, over to capture those power nodes. And while I'm doing that, I also take one of those smaller bases, the, you know, the one with the two slots on it. And then I make two more supply pads on my base and a generator for some energy. And then on the mini base, I create yet another supply pad and a barracks. From that point on, I just double pump marines and flamers or grunts and suicide grunts if I were to play the Covenant. And I try to control all those power generators or at least three out of the five on the map to get map control and get more income. Uh, then while upgrading my supply pads, I keep making units until I hit max population. And the moment I start having too much money, I take a second base. I get more generators, more supplies, and uh, you know, I just, I just keep going from that point on. It really depends. It usually cripples the enemy enough to the point where I can just phase roll and win, uh, but usually I decided to not finish them off and actually stay back to play around with different units and see what's good and whatnot. I'm, you know, still learning the game and since there's no practice mode, I practice all my weakened enemies. So yes, the ultimate abilities are strong, but does that mean that they're unbalanced? Not necessarily, I just don't have the knowledge or the skills yet to know how to use those properly or how to counter them. 
Uh, so for that reason, I want to skip the balance conversation for now. I'll let my Banshees get wrecked by anti-air turrets, or I'll have my Brutes jump on a base and instantly kill it. Is that how it's supposed to be? I don't know. I can't tell right now. But yeah, other than the new upgrades, the new gameplay mechanics, the new units, so many other smaller improvements have been made going from Halo Wars 1 to Halo Wars 2. For example, maps are perfectly symmetrical for as far as I know. The pathway finding is so much better. Units do not get stuck and are not afraid to move through each other if needed. Uh, and also very underrated, you can actually move units on top of base locations if there are no buildings yet. I mean, choke points are still a thing uh, and choke points can be very useful to you, but moving around the map already feels so much better. Also, very underrated here, the AIs on the capture points do not attack your units unless you attack them first, and the deathmatch game type doesn't have any AIs to begin with. I'm so happy with that, it's purely player versus player, which adds a lot less random to the equation. Actually, I believe that randomness has been removed in its entirety. Um, of course, one of the biggest complaints that I always had about Halo Wars 1 is that so many projectiles that units shot at each other would miss, and thus you would be losing out on a lot of potential damage. Some units like the Covenant Raid suffered greatly from it because the projectile was so slow and it really got to the point where that unit would just be completely useless. Well, not completely useless, I guess it could work versus Goshawks, but you get my point, the raids were supposed to be a lot better than that. Now this randomness seems to be removed in Halo Wars 2 as well, because yes, you still have those projectiles that are missing the targets a lot of the times uh, visually, but it doesn't seem to affect the inflicted damage. Just look at my Hornets going full retard here and completely overshooting this tank. But then the damage it receives is still consistent. This seems to be the case with everything. Projectiles can miss visually, but the damage is still applied, which I'm very, very happy with. Thank you. Now, put all of what I said together, and what I'm seeing here is developers that either know how to build a good RTS game, or developers that have listened carefully to the feedback that Halo 1 users gave. Maybe it's one of those, maybe it's both. Either way, good job. I, I really think I'm seeing a recipe for success here. However, it isn't all perfect. It would be a very boring video if there wasn't some part that I think needed some improvements. And this is the part of the video where I want to lay down some things that could use an improvement. And I want to put down suggestions and maybe talk about what I would like to see from this game upon release. So first up, uh, let's go with some of the minor things. The control groups, for example. For those that haven't caught onto it yet, if you hold down the left bumper on the controller, uh, you can assign groups with any of the D-pad buttons. Now, I believe that this addition of control groups is great. I think it is very much needed in a game like this, where a lot of units have special abilities, such as the grenades, an area of effect cloak, or even something as simple as an alternate firing mode. But unfortunately, this control group system isn't perfect. For starters, you do not have a way to add more units to an already existing group. I can imagine that this can become a pretty big nuisance at higher levels. One situation in particular that I can think of is when a part of my army is positioned somewhere on the map and already moving around, looking to keep map pressure, making sure the enemy doesn't slip by and counterattack my base. But then I also have a main rally point on the map where all my units will go once they are built. It would be really good if once every 20 seconds or so I could, uh, for example, select all the benches that I created at that point and add them to the main army already on the field. But if I would want to do that, I would have to first manually select all the banshees, then move them to the main army, and then select all the units again to create a new group altogether. That's a lot more work than just having to select the banshees and add them to the already existing group. I am assuming that this is a console-only problem because uh, with the controller, you don't have as many buttons as with a keyboard. And I hope that the version that is released on Windows 10 will not have this issue, but nevertheless, I think that the veteran console players would appreciate it if uh, you would be able to add units to an already existing group. I suggest allowing that players have the option to hold another button besides the left bumper, or if it is too complicated to hold three buttons at the same time, then maybe allow players to add units to the control group by default instead of creating a new group every time. I understand that all of these things would make it a little bit more difficult and complicated for the newer players and uh, the learning curve might increase a little bit with that, but I also think that uh, a lot of the experienced players would appreciate this. 
One last thing that I've noticed about these control groups is that selecting units with the control group is not as responsive as I would like it to be. When I quickly press the left bumper and then use any of the D-pad buttons, it sometimes doesn't register that I wanted to select that group. I figured out that it is actually required to hold down the left bumper for a bit longer until the group is actually selected. But because the left bumper is also assigned to increase camera movement speed, it isn't always ideal nor is it as smooth. I am aware of the fact that this could simply be an issue that is there because it is a beta. But it was annoying enough uh, that I felt a need to point it out. The control groups are there so that you can select units quickly. They are key to use mid-fight. But I actually had trouble with selecting the units quickly. So that's something that needs to be looked at. Now another thing that uh, I'd like to touch upon are the mini bases. Now don't get me wrong, I really like the idea of these and I think that these mini bases, they add a lot to the game. But the problem that I found with them is when it comes down to controlling them. Again, problems with the controls. I've had situations where I've had multiple of these smaller bases and also multiple bigger bases and because, as I said earlier, I crippled the enemies and I was just messing around with the new units, all my production took place on my third base. But every time that I wanted to snap my camera to the third base, I had to press left on the d-pad to jump to every smaller base first before I finally arrived at that third base. And then of course, once it finally snapped to the third base, I often overshot and I had to do the same thing for another 6 or 7 times. This could just be me being bad at the game, but uh, this mechanic has been here since Halo Wars 1 of course, and I'm very well used to it. I feel that this is an issue because unless you're really good at memorizing which base you took in which order, um, this will slow you down, it's very gimmicky. Now I am aware of the fact that you cannot let players make their own custom camera locations. That's simply not possible with the controller in a reasonable way. But what I suggest should be done is that the main bases, the bigger ones, the ones that you can actually upgrade, take priority over the smaller bases when it comes down to which base you jump to when pressing on the left button for the d-pad. This still allows players to utilize the one and the two slot bases early on in the game with easy access to them camera wise. But once they get to the mid game and they establish a second or maybe even a third base, that one takes priority and comes first in the cycle. I think that that would solve a whole lot without changing up the controls in any way. Also, there's one last minor thing that I would like to see adjusted and this is an issue that is the result of a better pathway finding system, to be honest with you. Um, because units are now able to move over base locations when no base has been built there, it can become very difficult to select units with the paintbrush or with the A button if they are on top of a base location. The reason for this is because the A button is also assigned to opening the selection wheel to build a base. And although there are other ways to select your units, such as, you know, local units, all units, or simply using the paintbrush right next to that building and then swoop it over, I think that I have a very easy solution and I see no reason not to implement it. I think that the game should open the selection wheel for the base building upon releasing the A button and not upon pressing it down. That means that if you hold down the A button and thus not releasing it, the wheel will not open and thus the game should recognize that you want to use the paintbrush. I of course do not know how difficult it is to program something like that, so maybe uh, my easy fix isn't as easy as it seems. But I think that if they could solve this somehow, that would go a long way, at least for me. I use the paintbrush a lot. And uh, while we're talking about the paintbrush anyway, a little bit off topic, but uh, I would like it to be a little bit smaller. Right now it's a little bit too big for my liking and it's hard for me to precisely pick out 4 or 5 marines out of the 10 that I have. And I just feel like it's a bit too big for me. But I guess now it's time to talk about the big elephant in the room and that is the performance. Now, as I said earlier, I know that this is just a beta and it's not a demo which is called a beta there to attract more players. I believe that this is a real beta here to test the game and thus help the developers. It is a very early version. It is not very well optimized, it has a lot of bugs and crashes and all that stuff. Um, but I feel like I have to mention some of these issues anyway, because I would hate myself if the final game came out and it would still have some of these things and then no one ever spoke about it. I would think to myself, damn, I should have mentioned this. Maybe, just maybe, it would have helped, but maybe not, you know, what's the chance, but... Um, I want to talk about this anyway because it's a real topic and I have real concerns. Also, seeing how bad the performance still is for the original Halo Wars seven years after the game was released, you know, that's enough to make me worried. I think these concerns are entirely justified. 
even though it's a different developer, different development studio, different people working on the game. Bottom line, I want to get my point across. So let's talk about graphics. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is the screen tearing and the frame drops. To this day, the very first Halo Wars game still has a lot of both. And this is something that has never really been fixed. A lot of the time you can still see the screen cutting itself in half, especially when moving the camera around and the game stutters very heavily mid-fight. This is for both the original Halo Wars game and the Halo Wars 2 beta. I also feel that for a big part, this is the cause that a lot of players are having complaints about the controls. I think the layout is fine, but because everything feels so slow, so clunky and messy, it doesn't feel right. Aside from the performance issues though, I've also noticed that this game runs at 30 frames a second at its best. Now I know that a lot of the games on the Xbox One run on that 30 frames a second, so I think that this is what they're going to be aiming for, but seeing how Halo 5 aimed for a 60 frames a second experience, I was hoping Halo Wars 2 followed that same trend. I cannot deny that graphically, the game looks good, uh, very good for an Xbox One game, even in its current beta phase. Um, a lot of time went into this, there's no denying that, and it will satisfy the more casual players who want to build a big army and have big battles. It looks visually spectacular. But I myself, I care more about the gameplay and uh, the gameplay mechanics, and uh, maybe the competitive aspect of it a little more, and I would appreciate it and be a lot happier with it if this game looked something like Halo Wars 1, uh, with lower detailed models and uh, less special effects, and instead ran at a smooth 60 frames a second at all times. If the developers want to make themselves legendary, they could give the players on the Xbox One the option to run the game at reduced details, but at 60 frames a second, in the multiplayer part of the game. This way, everybody can choose uh, a preset either for low or high details that will satisfy the needs for both type of players. I know that this generally isn't done on consoles and I'm not expecting this to happen, but it would be extremely well received among many, many players that I am very sure of. Now, with that being said about the graphics and all that stuff, I'd also like to add that when I'm playing a competitive game on the PC, I usually end up tuning the graphics down by a lot anyway. That's not because my computer cannot run it, but it's because there will be a lot less visual clutter. In competitive games, it is important that I can see what is going on at all times, and with all the smoke and the fire and the beam effects that all these units in Halo Wars have, that can make it very difficult at times, there's a lot of visual clutter. This to me is enough to completely turn the graphics down so that I can actually see what is going on and actively react to it. You know, micro my army. So yeah, I'm not expecting this to happen, but uh, I'm damn well hoping for it. And then almost last on my list, I'd like to see more in-game statistics. Right now, I don't know how much health any of my units have, uh, or how much damage that they do, or what the range are on certain units. And I think that this has to be more clear. Many of the upgrades in the game tell you that units are 15% stronger or 30% stronger and that kind of stuff. And that's the start. But it's not good enough. Um, I mean, is the 30% additive? Is it multiplicative? Is it the 15% on top of the 15% that we already had? Or is it the whole 30% on top of the 15%? These are all things that I have no clue about, but that I would really like to know to determine how valuable any of these upgrades really are. Then besides those numbers, you also have upgrades uh, that have the description as simple as increases damage and increases health. It doesn't say how much, it doesn't tell you anything other than saying that the units will be stronger. And I can understand that an extensive description cannot be given in the small menus of these games. It would uh, give you a lot of visual clutter, maybe too much information, and it would honestly confuse the newcomers to this game. Also, most people probably don't care enough, this is only for the competitive scene. So what I'm suggesting is releasing an online information document released on a supported website where all of this information would be given. It would be a good alternative instead of having it in the game, and it would be enough to satisfy the competitive scene. Information about each player would also be a good addition. I would like to look at a player's gamer card and see his uh, win-loss percentage, his rank, his most played leader, his best map maybe, his total amount of games, those kind of things. That would be really good if we had that. Now, this video is already pretty lengthy, so I'll wrap it all up by touching up on one final part, and that is that I want a replay system and an observer mode for multiplayer games. I feel that in today's day and age, a replay system or observer mode, that's kind of a must with so many different media platforms like YouTube and Twitch. Many people want to share their best moments or their best game with others, and uh, that is also a part of what keeps people coming back. People want to play the game, but they also want to look up videos, tutorials, they want to look up new strategies, try out new things, get better, 
maybe even watch or participate in online tournaments, that is all really good for an RTS game. I noticed that the developers already had a ranking system similar to that of Halo 5, so I'm not too worried about leaderboards and that kind of stuff. I think that those will all be in there, but for someone like me who wants to maybe host tournaments and cast those on YouTube, uh, make videos about the game, all that stuff, uh, a replay system and an observer mode is kind of a must have to do anything really. Unless every game I'm gonna cast is gonna be a game that I played and that's, you know, not always ideal. I'm just saying that if this game manages to sort out its issues before the release of the game and actually manages to polish itself up, I really want to get into this, I want to go all out with this game. But for me to do that and really go all out, I need in-game tools that allow me to do just that. Otherwise, it's just gonna be gameplay videos and I don't know how far I wanna go with just those. With all of that out of the way though, I'm excited to see the PC version later down this year when more polishing has been done and uh, maybe when we get to see the game in a better daylight. For now, that is all I have to say. I mean, <laughs> it's, let's not make this video any longer than it already is. Anyway, as always, I really hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you guys later. Or like they say, in the Netherlands. See you later!